This video is an introduction to phylogenies, which are one of the ways biologists organize life on Earth. First, let's take a look at the word phylogeny. So the root word phylo comes from the Greek word that means tribe or race. And then jenny, the suffix, which we've seen in lots of other terms, refers to um, how something is produced or where it comes from. It comes from the Greek word that means to be born. Um, so think about generate or genesis, um, where something comes from. So a phylogeny is the evolutionary history of an organism or group of organisms, and it also includes relationships to other organisms both close relationships and uh, more distantly related groups. A phylogeny is essentially the story of where an organism or group of organisms came from. Uh, it's also important to note that a phylogeny is a hypothesis about how organisms are related to one another. Phylogenies are generated using morphological data, so physical characteristics, the fossil record, um, as well as DNA sequences, and best practices in generating phylogenetic hypotheses will just be discussed uh, later in further videos. So let's take a quick look at a couple of phylogenetic trees. So a phylogenetic tree is a tool that we can use to depict these evolutionary relationships. Um, a tree is a diagram, um, a map, an illustration of how organisms are related to each other. So both of these images are phylogenetic trees, and they both depict the same story, the tree of life on Earth. Uh, this one is a more artistic version. And this one is more scientific and perhaps gives us more information, but they are essentially saying the same thing. Here is the common ancestor. last universal common ancestor, or LUCA, and then you see the point at which this lineage branches and gives rise to bacteria over here and eukaryotes over on this branch. That's going to be all of your eukaryotes. And what looks probably like archaea on this branch here in the middle. On your other tree, you see the same thing. You see Luca, our last co universal common ancestor. This lineage diverges into the branch that leads to bacteria over here to the left. And then going in this direction, the branch that's eventually going to give rise to Eukarya with Archaea diverging there along the way. So the idea is that there are lots of different ways to draw phylogenetic trees. And it depends on the type of question you are asking which type of tree will be most appropriate and perhaps the most informative. So for an example of that, let's compare and contrast rooted trees versus unrooted trees. A rooted tree, as you see here, shows a lineage from which all the rest of the taxa shown on the tree diverge. So here's that lineage. There's that root. This type of tree shows relationships among organisms, and it also illustrates that all of the organisms on the tree have evolved from that single common ancestor. On the other hand, an unrooted tree, as you can see here, does not indicate a single lineage, and that there is no root anywhere. Um, that shows a single lineage that gives rise to the rest. So an unrooted tree like this one still shows relationships among organisms. As you can see, you still have your um, the green branch here representing archaea as it does over here. Then you have your red branch with uh, eukaryotes, just same as you see over here. And then all of your blue <coughs> groups representative of your bacteria, same as you see over here in the rooted tree. But what's missing is that um, that single lineage that's giving rise to all the rest. So while the unrooted tree does address relationships, it doesn't address ancestry. 
Now we'll take a look at some tips on how to read phylogenetic trees. So basically all trees are going to consist of nodes and branches. On a rooted tree, a node, which is also sometimes called a branch point, indicates that shared common ancestor from which two distinct lineages diverged. So this is our first node that we see where the lineage that comes from the last universal common ancestor diverges into the two lineages that give rise to bacteria um, and archaea and eukarya in this direction. So that is a node. You also see other nodes. You see a node here. That's a node. That's a node. Anywhere where you see a lineage branching off into um, a different group is a node. So it is in, in, in effect, it's the point in evolutionary history when a single taxon branches to form new and distinct taxa. So notice on this tree, we have the root right here. And then not too far down that branch, we encounter our first node right there. The branch that diverges here is referred to as a basal taxon. The term basal is used to describe position or closeness to the base or the root of the tree. So basal taxa are those that evolve early in terms of the root and are often less branching, which means they are usually less diverse than more derived lineages. So this is a good example on this sort of generic tree, but we can take a look at uh, another example from real life that may be more familiar. So if we think about mammals, and we can go ahead and draw a tree here to use as an example. We have mammalia. And then within the mammal clade, you have monotremes, which are the ones that actually retain the ancestral condition of laying eggs. And then you have marsupials, who give live birth, but the young finish maturing in their pouch. And then you have eutherian mammals, which are essentially your placental mammals. Now the vast majority of mammal species are gonna be found in the marsupial group or in eutherians, by far the vast majority. So within monotremes, you only have five species that are extant. So one species of platypus, four species of echidnas, and that's all you have on that branch. So monotremes within mammalia are a really good example of a basal taxon, uh, a basal lineage. So it branches early with respect to the common ancestor of all mammals, and it doesn't branch very much past that point. So there isn't a ton of diversity in that group, which is pretty characteristic for what we would describe as a basal taxon. So another term that we want to pay some attention to or to introduce is a sister taxon. Sister taxa. So sister taxa are two groups that share a node. Um, so these two lineages here and here would be described as sister taxa because they share a node uh, right here, which indicates a, a common ancestor as we've discussed. So if we wanna look back at our mammal phylogeny, we can see that marsupials and eutherians share a node right here. Let's make that, this node right here. So marsupials would be sister to eutherians. Eutherians are sister to marsupials. These are sister taxa. However, if we move back further in time to this node, now we can describe monotremes as sister to the therians or the clade that contains both marsupials and eutherians. So now you've got monotremes and therians 
this group here that are sister considered sister taxa. And that is often the case. So the case is that the position on the tree determines how groups can be described with respect to one another. So um, that's just one of the reasons that learning to read phylogenetic trees can be a little bit challenging, but also uh, pretty fun. So the next term that we'll discuss is polytomy. This is when you have more than two lineages that branch from the same node as we see here. Polytomy here. Notice this node and there are one, two, three, four branches coming from that same node. When we see polytomy on a phylogenetic tree, that indicates that the relationships at that node are not clear or have not been resolved. When drawing your own trees, you will only use polytomy in those cases. If you have a well-supported hypothesis regarding relationships among groups of organisms, you would never draw a polytomy. So just be aware that um, that is what that means if you see that on a tree. It's also helpful to understand that rotating nodes does not change what a phylogenetic tree says. Um, in order to sort of clarify what I mean by that, let's take a look at these two trees. So this tree on the left, we can see that we have a common ancestor, this node here, that branches into this basal lineage, which is group number two. So these are just species uh, identifiers, group identifiers across the top here. So you can see that um, from this branch, you have a second node here. You can see that you've got relationships uh, between 20 and 3 and 14, with 3 and 14 being sister. See, they share a node here. And then 20 is considered sister with the group that contains 3 and 14. Um, 1 and 16 would be considered sister taxa, sharing a node right here and um, sort of off on this branch by itself, still more closely related to 20 and 3 and 14 than they are to 2, but more closely related to one another. Um, so if you look at the tree on the right-hand side, you've got um, a different order as far as where you see your species number. So 2 is the same. You've still got your basal taxon over here from the node branching in this direction. Um, but the numbers look a little bit different. So what has happened is you've actually rotated at a couple of nodes. So the first place that we see rotation is this node here. So notice instead of 1 and 16 being on the right-hand side and 3, 14, and 20 being on the left-hand side like they are in the tree on the left, on the green, let's call it the green tree, they are flip-flopped. So you've actually rotated this node here from one side to the other. Now, you also see that instead of 1 and 16 being on the left and the right respectively, you've got 16 on the left and 1 on the right, so those are switched. But all that is doing is actually rotating this node, so flip-flopping who's on which side from one side to the other. The relationship remains the same, so 16 and 1 are still close relatives, still sister taxa, just like they are over here. They're just flip-flopped around this node. So that's what I mean by rotating nodes. And the same thing goes for this group that contains 3 and 14 and 20. So the same relationship is depicted here. It's just rotated around this node. So you've got 20 on the right and 3 and 14 on the left, whereas on the green tree you've got 20 on the left and then 3 and 14 on the right. So you can see that there's been rotation at this node. But still the relationships remain the same. 3 and 14 are sister to one another. 20, sister to the clade that contains 3 and 14. So the same story is being told by both trees. The same relationships are illustrated on both trees. It's just rotation around the nodes, which is an important thing to keep in mind as you're learning how to read trees as well. So another thing we can do is 
we can use trees to illustrate the evolution of derived characters. Remember, a derived character is a feature that evolved along the lineage leading up to a particular group, um, and that feature distinguishes that group from other lineages. So we can take a look at a couple of derived traits um, on this particular tree. So keep in mind that shared derived traits, that is derived traits that we see in uh, multiple lineages, can be used to build phylogenies. So let's take a look at what's going on here. So we, here we have the common ancestor of all vertebrates coming in on this root here. So we have a rooted tree. At this first node, you've got a branch into groups that have a, vert a vertebral column. So that vertebral column arises here along this lineage. Um, organisms that don't have a vertebral column are placed over here on this branch. But everybody going forward from this branch has a vertebral column. So we're looking at actual vertebrates. From here, at the next node, you'll see the next derived character is a hinged jaw. So the hinged jaw is going to arise right about here on this lineage. So organisms that are considered jawless fish, like lampreys, are going to end up on this branch, while everybody else everybody past this point on the tree all have um, jaws. From here you have the evolution of paired appendages, right? So you're looking at, in this case it's legs, so we're sort of skipping over um, paired fins and going straight to legs. So we're going to make the jump to tetrapods here. So you can see the evolution of legs. If you don't have legs, you are over here. Everyone going forward has legs. The same thing happens here with the amniotic egg. So you have your amphibians falling out here and all of your amniotes going forward. And then finally, hair shows up as a derived character um, on the branch that's gonna lead to mammals. So everybody beyond this point has hair. And if not, you can fall over here with the reptiles. So you can just sort of see here that you can use phylogenetic trees to also trace the evolution of derived characters uh, among different groups. So now that we have a grasp on how to use phylogenetic trees, uh, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about taxonomy. So taxonomy is a system that we use to classify organisms into taxa or taxonomic groups. Um, the system we use is sometimes called the Linnaean system named for Carolus Linnaeus, a Swedish, nat Swedish naturalist who developed the system um, and who is remembered as the father of modern taxonomy. Uh, once evolutionary relationships have been worked out, once the phylogenies have been um, sort of illustrated for us, we can classify organisms into hierarchical groups, each one more specific than the one above it. Uh, so that any organism belongs to um, a broad, the broadest classification group, uh, a domain, and then narrows down into a kingdom, uh, followed by a phylum, a class, an order, a family, a genus, and finally a species. Linnaeus also introduced binomial nomenclature, which is the naming system under which an organism is called by its genus and species, otherwise known as its scientific name. So there is a very specific way in which we use scientific names. So genus is capitalized, as you see here, and the species name is not. Um, however, both are italicized. So you can see some examples here, Canis lupus, Homo sapiens, Daphnia magna. In all of these, you see that same format. So capital letter for the genus, lowercase for species, and of course the whole thing is in italics. Um, frequently the genus name is abbreviated, especially when the organism is widely known or discussed, um, as in the case of things like model organisms. So if we look at um, C. elegans, for example, the genus name for C. elegans is Cynorhabditis. So you can imagine if you are a researcher and you're working on this 
particular nematode and you are writing about it and you're discussing it on a daily basis, it's a whole lot easier to do away with all of this and just call it C. elegans. The same thing can be said for E. coli, a ubiquitous bacterium, a common model organism. It's found all over the place. The genus name in this case is Escherichia coli, which as you can see is much easier if we just take all that out and just call it E. coli. So that's a little bit about how we go about naming organisms. So let's take a closer look here at the taxonomic groupings for our familiar family dog. So you've got the domain as the broadest group here, leading into kingdom, and then phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, and then finally subspecies, which will take a little bit closer look at how this works on the last slide here. Let me zoom in a bit. All right, so you'll notice that the domain is by far the broadest group. The domain for our family dog is eukarya. So in this clade, you have all organisms that are considered eukaryotes. So here's a nice selection of eukaryotic organisms. As we move down to um, the kingdom level, so dogs belong in the kingdom Animalia. So who falls out of the grouping here? Because we're getting more uh, specific as we move down the line. We lose our plant. So plant falls out and now we just have animals included. So as we move down to the more uh, specific or less inclusive phylum level, now we're in chordata. So we lose our invertebrate, the insect falls out, and so now we just have fish, uh, human, cat, fox, jackal, wolf, and dog. From here, we go down to class, so we're looking at mammals, so class mammalia. We lose our fish, now we've got just mammals included in this group, familiar organisms, human, cat, fox, jackal, wolf, dog. Next, we have order, so even more specific, we're talking about carnivora. So you've got cats included, but you lose the human, so humans don't belong in that particular order. So we now have cats, foxes, jackals, wolves, and dogs. De next, we go down to family canidae, which is going to lose the cat, so the cat drops out. We've got fox and dog and relatives. Then we finally narrow it even further down to genus, which in this case is canis. The, gen, uh, the genus that includes jackals, wolves, and dogs. At the species level, we've got Canis lupus, but we're still just at wolf and dog. We're trying to get all the way down to our familiar family dogs, so we actually go all the way down to the level of subspecies, so Canis lupus familiaris, and there is our family dog. Subspecies is actually an even more specific division beneath species, which indicates that although members of the species, so in this case wolf and dog, could um, breed and produce viable offspring, um, they're separated by other types of, of factors. In this case, the fact that wolves are not domesticated, but dogs are domesticated, so that makes them um, a subspecies. But the idea is to just see the way that these evolutionary relationships and genetic relationships and even physical characteristics uh, allow us to classify organisms from the very specific level um, all the way up to very general um, or very inclusive group like domain.